The commoditization of music is the death of creativity. Artists are selling their souls and their music rights for a big pile of cash. Bob Dylan, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Future, Shakira, and Justin Timberlake to name a few. They all made their music, but they don't own it. One man with billions of dollars to spend has a mission, to own all pop music. You got more music for me? The music royalty business is complicated and very messy, but continue watching and you'll understand how crazy this business really is. Let's summarize it quickly with an example, Bob Dylan's song, Knocking on Heaven's Door. Every song has two copyrights, the sound recording, which is the sound heard, and the composition, the lyrics and melody. Bob Dylan wrote and performed the song, so he has partial ownership of both the writing royalties and the performance royalties. However, there are other parties that also have a share in the ownership, such as record labels and publishers, due to the contracts Bob Dylan signed when creating the song. Depending on how the music is then heard, such as through streaming, performed live, or on TV, that will also affect who gets paid and for how much. There's lots of different types of royalties, so for this video, we focus primarily on the payments for just streaming the music. This is boring. Every time an artist's music is streamed on a service such as Spotify or Apple Music, the artist gets a very, very small payment in the form of a royalty. With millions of streams per day, however, those small payments that are usually around a fifth of a cent per stream can add up to a reasonable amount of income. For example, Mariah Carey still receives an estimated 2.5 million per year for her share of the royalties for the song All I Want For Christmas Is You. Not bad for a song that came out in 1994. Instead of viewing a song as a creative expression, investment analysts are using financial models to calculate the long-term income of each hit record. If a song can produce predictable revenue year after year, you can treat that song like a dividend-paying stock. Let's say it costs $2 million to buy one of Billy Joel's songs. If that song makes $200,000 per year in royalties, it would take 10 years to break even. After that, assuming the same popularity, that song will now be all profit for the company that bought the rights. Investment analysts are attempting to calculate how long certain songs will remain popular for. Once they figure out the estimated future popularity of the song, they take the annual revenue from the royalties, apply a multiple, usually 10 times the current annual revenue, and that's the amount they offer to the artist. Most music royalty companies often have a very specific criteria for what makes an investable song. It must have a long track record of performance and predictable revenue. Therefore, that really only leaves songs that are seasonal, like a Christmas song, or a timeless classic, a song that is popular amongst multiple generations. What about that one guy that's spending billions of dollars on pop music though? Merrick Mercuriatus, CEO of the Blackstone-backed music royalty fund company, Hypnosis. He raised almost a billion dollars in 2018 to buy hit songs. The crazy thing is that he isn't just buying individual songs with a long cultural lifespan, he's starting to buy out the entire artist's catalogs. Some say he's willing to buy the good, the bad, and the ugly as part of his plan to own all pop music. Remember how those other fun companies typically pay 10 times annual revenue to purchase a song? Merrick pays 20 times. You slash and burn, you buy everything in sight until 22. Then call me. Now, other big companies are following suit, offering ridiculous amounts of money to these artists and songwriters. Why would the artists give up those annual payments if they knew how much it would make them in the future? If someone wants to buy them, it's because they see a good deal. The problem is that these payments can be best described as a river of nickels. Their payments take time to accumulate to anything worthwhile, and for big artists that are still performing concerts, the amount they receive from royalties is usually a very small fraction of their total income. Quite simply, for the big artists, an additional few hundred thousand per year in streaming revenue doesn't really affect them, because they are making multi-millions through other revenue sources such as performing concerts. So when Merrick offers to give them millions of dollars today in exchange for their rights to their songs, it's a deal that's hard to pass on, especially when you consider that selling the royalty rights usually has no effect on the artist's ability to go on tour. Many music artists don't have a retirement plan, so when they stop performing concerts, the money dries up. The annual streaming revenue isn't enough to keep up the level of lifestyle that they're used to, Therefore, many artists nearing the end of their careers are now deciding to sell their music rights as a massive retirement gift to themselves. It's bad. Down to my last 97 million. <clears throat> Leon. 197 million. It would have taken the artists decades to accumulate the income from music streaming that Merrick is offering these artists. 
it's not just him and his other fun company competitors paying big bucks anymore. Music corporations such as Universal Music Group paid an estimated $400 million to Bob Dylan in exchange for the copyrights to his entire song catalog. To make that money in royalties, it could take a lifetime of waiting. Given Bob Dylan is 81 years old, it makes sense for him to take the lump sum cash. The royalty fund company can live forever, the artist cannot. What is strange now is that young artists are starting to sell their music rights. Most notably, Justin Bieber is close to selling his music rights to Hypnosis for around $200 million. At 28 years old, this would make him the youngest mainstream artist to make a deal this size. Usually the purchasers of these songs want to see a long-term record of performance to get a proper estimate of future earnings. Newer songs don't have enough track record for them to properly gauge if the song will remain popular or die out. Justin Bieber has been struggling with Ramsey Hunt syndrome, which could affect his ability to go on tour in the future. Therefore, he might need this money now. It's my money and I need it now! It's my money and I need it now! In other cases, sometimes you don't have a say on your rights being sold. Taylor Swift, for example, had to re-record her own albums so that she would own the original recordings, known as the Masters. She made the decision to re-record her albums after her former record label sold her back catalog, leaving her with no control over how her songs are used, meaning her hit songs could be used anywhere, like in an ad for wart removal, and she wouldn't be able to say no. This new trend of artists selling their music catalog for a lump sum payday could have some creative concerns for the music industry. While the nature of pop music has always been to appeal to a broad audience by being simple and catchy, the sellout music is getting more obvious. For example, with many new songs coming out today, you can tell that there was a lot of thought that went into ensuring the song would become viral on apps such as TikTok. If artists can sell their music rights for many millions by producing music that remains culturally relevant amongst multiple generations, it would be financially irresponsible to make music that has a short lifespan. Expect in the future to see a lot more music artists slowly shifting away from what made them stand out to focus on producing music that is formulaic and designed for virality. Why challenge the status quo if the status quo makes you millions? Drake, for example, arguably the current king of R&B hip-hop, clearly has a team of producers that are concentrated on going viral and being safe enough in comparison to other rappers to transcend generations. His biggest hits are his safest songs, Hotline Bling, One Dance, God's Plan. It's all music your parents or kids could listen to together. It doesn't mean that they are bad songs. In fact, quite the opposite. The songs are popular because people enjoy them, but you can tell it's clearly been manufactured to appeal to the broadest audience possible. Drake isn't reinventing the wheel. He and his team are producing high-quality music at a pace few can compete with. When an artist sells their catalog, they're putting the control of their music in the hands of an investment firm whose primary concern is profit. While musicians have the opportunity to make millions, it's up to the artist to decide whether you can put a price on owning what you create and controlling the legacy you leave behind.